Hey guys, Dark Prometheus here, back with another tutorial video on Grand Tactician, and we're going through the military tab. I haven't watched the video that uh, History Guy Gaming did on military, so I'm not sure what he ultimately covered in it. I know he's doing some tutorial videos as well, so if there's anything that I miss, go ahead and, and check out his channel and. He'll likely have it. He's more in touch with the game wise um, than, than I am. He pays attention to more of it. I kind of get a lot of um, a lot of the update information from him. In many cases, from watching his videos. But if I haven't covered anything, oh, just head over there. Maybe he actually has. So the military tab. Let's start out looking at an army first. So here's Morgan's command. You have your commander. This is your men. Total available. This is your total available for combat. Disabled. This is your guys wounded. This is ones from sickness, things like this. These will not be available during combat. They are considered casualties. Now, they will cycle in and out of the army. This number will go up because this will be reduced. Uh, sometimes this number will go up, this one will go down. So this is a cycling number, both of these. So just remember that. Guns is cannons, overall cannons in the army. The morale will be there's eager, stable, nervous, broken, things like that. And those are the ones really tells you if the army is in retreat or not. How how well the army is actually staging there. We look at the army of the Ohio. Really, everyone's eager. Things like that. Obviously, this is the commander. This will tell you what, what supplies they are. So as you have combat, you're going to use supplies. As you move, you're going to use supplies. You're going to use provisions. Ammunition is only used during combat. Ammunition can be brought in more as uh, stores than anything. But essentially you have so much supply really for an army that I've never really had an issue with ammunition. Sort of come in with about half ammunition no matter who it is. You got provisions and you got forage which is kind of what the army is foraging for you have perks that can really do it like this obviously it's going to be you have these perks here that all the armies can get siege chains for sieging so if you have an army that has that you want to actually use for a lot of sieges this is how you use the siege train here field telegraph i think this both helps combat and the strategic map Allows orders to get faster to your units, or so they can respond faster. This is uh, combat, so it helps combat because when you actually order, give an order, it has to go down the chain of command, and the courier is the ones that pull it. So this is for in command. Balloon core, where you can see more of the enemy. The surrounding area, I think this also gives you military intelligence, but also able to see, I think, on the tactical battlefield. Real military information, this, of course, is intelligence. Give you it on the strategic map. Cartographers. Pretty much, again, give you more of an idea on the strategic map, what's going on, and able to actually tell you what supplies and stuff are on the map. This reduces your supply, I think, but it also allows you to have fa faster marching, so it makes it... Makes that core or army able to maneuver faster, 
uh, go on longer marches. So this is what you want if you want a more mobile corps or army. Foot cavalry. This is guys that get behind the line and kind of harass pickets with your cavalry. Engineers and mechanics. This gives you your engineers which will allow you to do uh, fortifications faster on the battlefield. Ambulance corps which can help you with disabled and revamp and get them back into the able-bodied men. Pontoon train allows you to cross rivers quicker. Zappers and miners allows you to deal with fortifications easier. I think also on the strategic and also affects the tactical map. Land torpedoes. I never actually use land torpedoes. So I'm unsure what it does. Let's see what the tooltip says. Anti-personal explosive. But bar barbarian subterranean booby trap to hinder enemy movement. Ah, so when you're withdrawing or retreating, the ability to force the enemy army to be cautious and can't chase you. Okay. Partisan brigades, I don't really use a whole lot. Um, I mean, it could be good in certain cases because you're essentially using conventional art cavalry to harass the enemy. So you probably want to do it for raiding parties, but I never really use raiding parties all that much. Bushwhackers. Again, another one I don't really use all that much. I think the tooltip says. Real warfare bushwhacking aims to attract the enemy using ambush against military forces and civilian targets alike with non uniformed irregular cavalry. So, again, this is more like irregular uh, forces, kind of goes along with uh, partisan brigades. Better reporters allows the newspaper section to report. More uh, on the commanders and gets them more favorable and gets their deeds up, which will help their fame. Which we'll look at commanders here in a second. Limelight this is one I pick all the time for forts. This allows you to bombard enemy positions and also deal with enemies attacking you by being able to bombard at night. A very good one for forts. It's it's helped me in many occasions in like an, an an issue like this. If we had a core attacking this fort, these uh, this is superb for it. Expert scouts. Ah, uh, kind of iffy on this. This is the one where again. Picketed cavalrymen have the skills to avoid protection and mess around with uh, the enemy behind the lines. This is another one of a raiding perk. I do use it in my cav though. If I have a cavalry corps, I will use this. And river expedition actually allows you to get across the rivers on a strategic map faster, I think. Yeah, so this helps you deal with force on riverways. That means pontoon train. Let's see, you never really use pontoon. Quickly crossers with all the equipment. So yes, these are the ones that allow you tactical map to put pontoon trains on. The ones I typically use is. Siege train when attacking forts. Field telegraph on higher armies. So essentially like uh, Army of Northern Virginia. We have Lee and you have his five corps in the 1863 campaign. Or in this case, uh, the Army of the Potomac in the 1862 campaign. Have the top army... The actual army commander, not the corps commanders, but the army commanders, have field telegraph. 
allows you to maneuver your cores as a core faster and easier. Uh, if you have a large core, then this could help as well because then you need to be able to move each division quicker and that can help you. Never use balloon core. I use Bureau of Military Information on one unit, typically one of the infantry units, and then I will use that to kind of be able to see uh, for one core. Uh, when I use BMI, I also use skilled photographer, uh, cartographers with them. Flying column, I like to have one unit that's really able to move around, uh, one core that's able to move around quicker. Foot cavalry, uh, I don't really use as much because I prefer some of the cavalry to be more of a rating, but... This would go on with your flying column unit. I never typically have a flying column unit get uh, up there fast enough to have foot cavalry, but these two probably go pretty well together. I'll have one with engineers and mechanics, which allows me to then actually build fortifications on the battlefield quicker with that core. And then... I will combine it with sappers, which allows me to also attack fortifications faster on it. I also put sappers on the ones that deal with siege train because this still actually works on outside the battlefield. Right now, you can't fight forts on an actual fort battlefield. They're kind of just going in the background like this. So sappers and miners still helps that. If you have a situation like this as well, you do want to do... Uh, uh, pontoon with it as well the one that allows you to attack open up other fronts that might be the last one yeah so you, you want to do river expedition engineers uh, siege train and sapper to get that and then you're one that go engineer pontoon train and end up going like limelight or ambulance core is always good for anything that helps you get more disabled so ambulance core is really in a lot of things so it's always a good perk to take uh Never really use pontoon trains. Use sapper and miners sometimes. Land torpedoes I don't use. Now here with our cav, if I have one that is like Stewart's, like Jeb Stewart's cav, I think I ended up putting BMI on them. Uh, Partisan brigades, expert scouts, allow me to actually be able to see. But there's something to go with. You could go partisan brigades, bushwhackers, and expert scouts if you want to raid. Seems like a more powerful one for raiding. The better reporters, I typically put that on the one that has the Bureau of Military Information, the uh, actual core. Not like a big, big thing with it but sometimes i'll put it in there limelight of course for my forts anything attacking forts expert scouts or cav is good rubber expedition you already know that now how these kind of work is say for example this is fort donaldson let's give them limelight and because they are actively in combat quickly sieges help you with this a ton it is absolutely insane on how much it helps you here let's go what BMI since it's a fort see more round not sure if we will get it Yes, forts can't get it. So essentially, when you get a perk 
You will then get a flag here, and which designates an elite unit, which from there, you can select the flag, and they'll have two flags on there, and designate that they're an elite unit. Now down the situation, this obviously tells you that this is a core. This will tell you it's a fort, artillery. This will tell you it's core of an army. Here we go. We can do it with uh, this one. Billions. Uh, go with the telegraph. Uh, one of these has to actually go to three. So, yeah, once you get a three, you'll have that flag there. Down here, this gives you the stats that they're in. In this fact, they're in siege combats over here. They're in winter quarters. Not sure if this designates what the symbol is around the NATO uh, tag. Tells you the readiness. I think a lot of readiness ends up being low. Because it's still in the winter. I think everyone is. You have readiness out here because they weren't in their winter quarters. The readiness is really on the stance you're in. If you're in winter quarters, then your readiness is going to be low. The intelligence that they gather around them, what the condition of the army is, and the training. We have that. Our tags down here go to stance, so offensive and defensive. Offensive, they'll move the sound of the guns with this outer ring. In defensive, they will not. So that's one thing to remember, but defenses is better for sieges. Cavalry orders. So if you have attached cavalry in this army, you can send it to scouts, which will give you more intelligence, I think it is. Let's see what, this, what it says. Intelligence and the readiness of the unit. Only cavalry organized as cavalry corps will fight in field battles. So, this is default setting is nothing. So, with this. If you have a cavalry four, so there's no cavalry in this army, so that would be pointless to do that with him. Say here, this has a cavalry brigade, we would be able to do it with the Army of the Mississippi. Uh, with the Army of the Potomac, would be able to do it the actual army itself would be able to do it because of this and then some of the cores like this core would be able to do it because of this cavalry you kind of get the gist of it a scouts obviously this is raiding for raiding i think this will actually get you both ammunition provisions i'm unsure if it actually gives you more forage because everyone's forage is always max but this burns down infrastructure, forges all supplies that they can carry. The skirmish with enemies within range, an unopposed rating lowers support among civilian populations. So you can then mess with their support. And then guarding is really all about guarding your supply trains between you and your nearest supply depot, but also from areas of communication. So, part of the cavalry uses to stop routing men behind the battle line. So, it does reduce desertion. So, this will help you if you're getting your ass stopped. But, the guarding cavalry will not fight in field battles. So, you'll lose a cavalry advantage. Construction you can construct forts, depots, and telegraphs. Telegraphs will allow you to get orders from DC to the army faster than just waiting for someone to transport. So, for example, 
to move this army here they didn't give me a time on it that's weird okay they're uh, they're getting out of their winter quarters that's why um let's see another one Here's one. It's going to take four hours to get this communication. But four hours for them to move. There. So for the Union side, this isn't a big deal. Orders tend to go pretty quickly for the Union. For the Confederacy, it could be hours. That's because they're more industrialized. You have more. I think you actually have. Okay, you have telegrams all over here, and then from here, you don't have telegrams going through West Virginia. So I mean, but the order transfer is pretty quickly for that. It becomes an issue when you start dealing with cores, armies. I don't think any of these armies have cores. Like here it is. Now they're getting out of winter quarters and it's going to take four hours to get those orders. So with armies, it's easy to get those orders. Like Don Carlos Buell here, Government of Tennessee. When you start dealing with multiple cores, is the issue. Because then the orders have to come from DC to the, to the army commander. The army commander down to the corps commander the core commander can move so that is when it becomes tricky and when you're dealing with the uh the confederacy of that and you have a lot of core armies like for example this 1862 you have army on the mississippi here to move these cores that those orders have to come from richmond corinth so the Army of the Mississippi, Corinth to Jackson. Then the First Corps moves. Or same thing to Corinth, to Huntsville, to movement. So when you start dealing with cores and you start getting down into the weeds of it, you gotta remember that if you need to retreat from an army that's coming at you, you need to give yourself time to do it. There is no quick way to retreat. You could easily get yourself in a fight that you don't want. So always remember there's order delays in it. And then movement orders, if you want them to stop, stop their current movement order, which also takes time. And then force march, want them to move faster. And then this is the manage army. So let's go into manage army tab. And you come to this, which is also this military tab. So these are the same things. This will bring up this of the current army selected. This will bring up the tab all together with the first army. So you have your garrisons, which are all having commanders that have stats. You have your field armies. You also have your filters if you want to filter by origin of birth. Where our commanders from? Sort by alphabetic size, ranking, state, experience, field armies, garrisons, things like that. So you can filter all of those. Let's look at the army, largest army we have. The Army of the Potomac gives you an idea. We have George McClellan. He's got a hundred thousand men, seven thousand disabled, and fifty-eight guns. This would tell you more about the recruit states, blah, blah, blah. If you did all of this uh, of kind of like the lower, but if you raise the army itself, the army doesn't have contracts remaining or recruitment costs or recruits or anything like that. That doesn't come up here. You don't have to worry about, say, the Army of the Potomac having 
a contract 12 months you're going to lose him you have to worry about only below the actual brigades themselves so up here in the 1862 campaign we have cores unlocked each one of these gives you an ability to do things military one will give you the ability to make armies i think it is See what the tooltip says yeah so you're able to do armies these this is just contracts military two will allow you to make cores at this point we have just really this campaign's idea is that we've just hit the ability to make cores you go down each one of these gives you also recruitment so the military three the enrollment act bounties enrollment act will give you draftees to be able to do it and these will give you like more cheaper troops faster troop transport so on and so forth now this will give you more recruitment because you're paying people to actually volunteer and enrollment act is drafting to have draftees which is important for later on in the war you take on a lot of casualties let's go back to military tab times takes a second here we are with the army of the potomac and in 1862 we're able to have army corps so the four stars on this is an army it's the nato designation of an army this is the infantry designation the x x with four x's over it or stars depends what you want to think of it x's just designates this designates as an infantry army four stars an army three stars core one star is a division one star will be a brigade and then when you have two lines this is considered a division still but since it's artillery it's a smaller unit than an X. that's kind of like the gist of nato counters in 1862 so there's no crazy nato counters with circles for tanks anything like that. It's 1862 so you really just need to know the gist of nato counters is is really these these symbols and then you have horses as well infantry cavalry artillery horse artillery which is technically tote this is your version of towed artillery in 1862. You have horses that tow your artillery. Makes them faster on the battlefield. So, go back to the Army of the Potomac. So, you have your commander. McClellan, he's up here. He, your commander has commander traits. He's a major general. Each one has its own rank. You can actually put someone in command that is not actually the rank that he that he is supposed to be, and he'll be in parentheses. Let me find one. May not be one. Yeah, let's do it. So essentially. This one should be a brigadier. Let's put a lieutenant colonel. See that he is a lieutenant colonel. But since his billet is higher than what it should be, it happens sometimes. There is some bugs with the commander window at times. Looks like we encountered one. 
And that's one of the fixes they're doing in this patch is is actually doing that. So let's continue the scenario. What you can do to continue the scenario is you can either hit it there, or if it doesn't show up, you can go to Spring 1862, which is pain. Select their side. I don't think you need to. I'm not sure if you need to do this again. I already like this. You can just hit continue. But essentially, when you put someone that is not the correct uh, rank, in that case, we put a lieutenant colonel in what should be a brigadier general spot. He will essentially be a brigadier general in parentheses. It's really brackets. But when you look at his profile, still call him a, a lieutenant colonel. So I'm not sure if that actually leads to more feuds. If you have feuds turned on, if a brigadier general under him doesn't want to follow the lieutenant colonel, but that can allow you to have junior officers in charges, charge of things. And have junior officers under him so you can save your more experienced officers for other things. Let's put Barlow there. He's a lieutenant colonel. See? The billet is a colonel, but since he is a lieutenant colonel, he has essentially been promoted to a colonel. So that's how you promote people. I'm not sure uh, if... It changes if we'll have like a conflict between Sykes and Barlow, even though he was just uh, Colonel. That's kind of how you can promote people, promote that sort of thing. But remember, if you actually do this to someone, they can get the defame trait. And the defame trait makes it more difficult for them to command soldiers under them so make sure when you change commands like that that you don't have that i think that's something they're working on uh because i actually had an instance where robert lee for some reason was put in charge of a uh, artillery i took him off the artillery which got him defamed but i really just promoted him because i took him from an artillery division to the army head and he had the defamed the fame signal uh symbol is the, just this one which is the fame broken so you have some weird things so whoa, just watch out that when you're replacing commanders you're doing it in a way that you're not going to end up uh, defaming them having issues if the commanders are defamed i think I'm not sure if you can get the trade off, but you can just put them under a division commander. Should be fine. You know, I haven't tested it, but you should be. So back to the Army of the Potomac after that. So you have a commander where you see George McClellan here. He's a major general. In that case, I do not think a rank matters. Even if you have the lieutenant general as the union, because that's not one that's on the Confederate side. But here is Major General. His branch of arms is infantry. But I think this actually allows him to be better at commanding infantry, I believe. 
Um, yeah, increases readiness and marching ability of the unit and maintains and maintain fighting condition. So with people that have uh, artillery, it might just actually do the same thing, but for artillery. So you kind of want to, yeah, so this fire fast and accurate because these guns in pristine condition. It keeps your guns good. So essentially you want to have people that have those traits. Particularly, you want them in division, core, and army. Essentially, you want your army to be uh, under infantry, if possible, and then your cores under infantry, or in this case, this one under artillery, or this one under... Here you have an infantry, largely because probably not a cavalry officer here. You get it just there. You want to match it and go from there. Go back to Cullen. He's a veteran of the Mexican American War. So that will get him some fame, prestige, things like that. So then you have West Point graduates. So you have West Point graduates, which are military officers. You then have ones that are volunteers. So since he is a West Point graduate, he is able to take command of this unit quicker and easier. So you're not going to have a lot of issues. This is a volunteer here with Ed, uh, Edwin Sumter. Or Sumter. Sumner. So being a volunteer... He is actually appointed or elected to command, but he tends to be able to adapt to new kinds of uh, modern warfare. Uh, they tend to avoid personal conflict, so this will help you with feuds. But personal and politically appointed officers will have feuds more than, than that. So in this, this is a good matchup. You have a West Point officer and... A volunteer officer which will prevent feuds and see if there's one that's politically appointed one here's one right here so he has been politically assigned to command uh, this unit Why did his rank thanks to his political status commanding troops increase support in his home state? But he is adept to feuds. If removed from command, it will hurt the support of his state. Do you really have to worry about? Can I get away from that so we don't hear the battle noises? So you gotta really remember on what you want to do with your commanders. As you pull off politically appointed commanders, you could have an instance where you actually reduce your ability to recruit. So you have to be aware of that. Under the bug once again. Maybe. Possibly. Maybe not. Might be acting weird because of uh, because they're in combat. Okay, here we go. Probably acting weird because they're in combat. Carlos Buell. Good Don Carlos Buell. Oh, it did break again. 
Mind you, that's one thing they're going to fix in the next patch. Is commanders breaking. Like so. We'll get through this tutorial, guys. Don't worry. It's going to be a longer one because it's the military. I kind of want to go through every aspect. This will probably be twice as long as the uh, previous one. It's weird because I never have these issues when I'm uh, I'm recording my episodes. Army Command. Maybe it's maybe it's a new one, latest patch, and we haven't quite played a whole lot for the latest patch. Maybe. Oh. Let's see. Okay, let's open it up again. Okay, I'm in the Potomac. You got West Point graduate and you got fame. Fame is won by actually being exemplary, exemplary in combat. So you can get that. Essentially, you can get it for... Uh, it's from the newspaper writing. So you can get this if you get the trait that has... Uh, the newspaper writers which will give you an ability to get higher fame faster but also this you can get defame and how that kind of goes is how well the unit does in combat it's easier for say a brigade commander to get a, a famed or defamed trait i've seen i have not seen it for a division commander, I have seen it for corps commanders and army commanders if there's troops attached to them. Uh, I just haven't seen it for division commanders yet. But essentially, that ranks up the fame part. Initiative, uh, a lot of this stuff is for if you allow kind of like AI tendencies to go through. And this will uh, allow these kind of to occur. If you turn off the AI, their ability to actually control units, in many cases, these won't matter because your AI isn't going to do anything unless you have feuds turned on, and which feuds will then go in its own initiative, and these will matter. I kind of use a mix of it and I think I want to play more with the skill side and kind of let commanders do their thing so not only cautious but also incapable this commander would rather have someone tell him what exactly what to do to make a decision of his own so not great on the initiative he's great on leadership which is a big leader uh, initiative really just shows if he's going to attack the enemy and weak points and take advantage. Leadership will get uh, the higher the leadership, more men will follow him. So that kind of helps decrease the amount of views that you have leadership wise. So does fame. If you have a commander that's a higher fame, that's at a core or a division and that has a higher fame than the one above him you might have some feud issues as well so here he's a master administrator and again more so towards logistics so supply and then cutting is predictable which means he's not going to actually try to exploit the enemy in many cases so not good maneuvers on his march not gonna do any flanking maneuvers things like that he's a pretty safe uh, commander McClellan. this kind of gives you his updates i think before the war the west point graduate fought in the mexican-american war when he was promoted to lieutenant captain major general History will give you who has fought. So let's see if we can get someone that's fighting.
Oh, that battle isn't done yet. So, previous battles, win or lo uh, lose, will be actually be in the history. Kind of tell you what the history of the unit is. Going down to the core, same general idea, commander's history. Going down to division, same general idea. Here, same things. When you get down the brigade, you of course got the commander, same stuff. But now you get to see the unit. This is set, this infantry brigade is the second division of the second corps of the Army of the Potomac, taken from uh, the Minnesota Territory. So if this unit takes a large amount of casualties, it will affect the morale of Minnesota itself. Got eighty-five support. Just kind of shows you if. Uh, you're going to desert as that support goes down. You go into his desert spiral, essentially. You will lose troops. You'll start bleeding troops. Tell you if it's volunteers or draftees. These are volunteers. What their contract is, 36 months. What's remaining out of their contract, 29 months. And what the recruitment cost. And then what weapon they're using. You got Springfield Rifle Muskets which are obviously rifled muskets. Then as you go through here, this kind of tells you what you can upgrade to. The ones you can highlight are the ones you have unlocked. Tell you that Enfield rifle muskets have to be imported. Standardization goes with how many you have in an entire army and then how many you have in that core. As you have more standardization, your... Your ability to use the rifle increases, your ability to maintain the rifle increases, things like that. It becomes a point that it's a standardization in the army. So that's how that works. I haven't really got standardization up to anything noticeable, but I've also mixed a lot of weapons in my army. So there's that. So you have a different choices. You got like Lorenz, you got the Enfields. These are both import, you got imported from Europe. We don't have the Mississippi Rifles researched. However, the Mississippi Rifles for the Confederacy is already unlocked because it is a southern weapon. You have Fayetteville, Richmond Rifles, Whitworths. You have Sharps uh, Rifles, which are breech loader. This will tell you for production. If you haven't got the research for the Whitworth Rifles, go into more breech loader, some carbines, repeating rifles. Again, production, production, production. We haven't researched any of the, these. You get the Henry rifle, the Spencer repeating. You get mixed muskets, which is what everyone starts with. Smoothbore musket here. Everyone that you newly recruit gets mixed muskets as the standard. Plains rifles, minis, needles, reboard muskets. You can also uh, get those as well. I think they're... They're the step above the mixed muskets. So, not great, but their effective range is twice as much as mixed muskets. So, if you need to go for one that's uh, that you'd still uh, really need, it's probably cheaper, go to one of these. Essentially, though, as you, there's some of the policies. Go over here, Diplomacy 2 will unlock some. Diplomacy 2 allows you to import Enfield Muscatoons. So some of the Enfields there. Enfield Muscatoons are pretty good for cavalry. I typically use them for. Like Diplomacy 1, you can get uh, Enfield and Lorenz rifles, so that's where those import. For 3, I know it's 6 pound Whitworths, and I don't know what the other rifle was. Oh, it's Ironclad Turret Ships, it's 6 pound Whitworth rifles. So when you go into 4, so each one of these diplomacies really unlocks things. It allows you to import stuff from Europe, better rifles, things like that. So this is one path that you can get your rifles. Is this one gives you 12-pound Whitworth rifles 
and the mini the 1851 rifles, ocean going ironclad ram ships, and then diplomacy five will get you. Uh, actually, I haven't looked at diplomacy. We'll give you breech loading three inch Armstrong rifles, the newest innovation in the infantry weapons, needle gun. So you get, you can unlock, so there's multiple pathways. So you get unlocks through Europe. You can go through industrialization, which will unlock both ships and guns. So you got two pathways to really do it. I tend to get uh, the first part of Industry 1 as a confederacy. And then I think in this next campaign, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift to diplomacy. I'm going to get the first one in industry. I'm going to shift down to diplomacy. Uh, and really ramp up diplomacy to get see how well those guns are from Europe because this one allows us to get the basic things produced so it kind of tests how that goes out maybe I'll just abandon agriculture altogether and go in but those are your two paths industry and diplomacy are going to unlock weapons for you so as you upgrade things, you got to pay attention to also the effective range, the rate of fire. A lot of them have different rate of fire. You got the Mississippi rifles. Even though it's lining up, it's not researched. So I can't actually get it. So here's the effective range, which is the max effective range. So this isn't like when you're on the battlefield. This isn't the range where the dotted line is. This is the max effective range. So the farthest you can fire. And then your rate of fire, three a minute, three a minute, as you go through 16 a minute with the Spencers, 16 with the Henry. So you kind of get the gist of what you're doing here. You're upgrading groups here. So that will do it for that per portion. So let's look at what happens when you add a new, new unit. You get to this screen, and this tells you the state information. To give you support of the state, currently, been fielded from said state, the casualties the state has taken, the deserters from said state, and volunteers and drafts. So this number is kind of gets wonky, especially when you start uh, rating and stuff. I've seen like weird things where states had over two hundred and fifty thousand casualties. And it was just weird because the state doesn't have that many recruitable troops. And I can only assume that was occurring because of rating. And because of those rating, it, it counted as casualties, which took down the support. So you may see some odd numbers because I think rating and sieging areas actually has to be counted here. To affect the recruiting support right now since we only have volunteers volunteers for each states here uh, when it comes to what you can recruit infantry is a 3,000 at, at military 2 I think it increases because of contracts cavalry is 250 350 for both of the artillery and when you recruit one let's say let's recruit those boys from that are in Kentucky that are in Tennessee make it even better Don Carlos Buell let's recruit ones from Illinois we should do it and then let's recruit some from I don't know, Maine. Now remember, this army is in Tennessee. This first brigade from Ohio, uh, from Illinois is going to take 15 days. This one from Maine is going to take 42 days. So this shows you that the further away that you're recruiting, the longer it will take to get them 
to you. Though our standardization is Springfield rifle muskets, I'm unsure if that is... Okay. Typically, when you're the south, all it gives you is mixed muskets, but okay. They came in with Springfield rifled muskets from here, and that's kind of how you see that. You can see the support, each state, as you're clicking through, as your recruitment costs, so on and so forth. So, you have to be where, where you're recruiting troops from. Especially in the north if you're going south, and especially if you're the south going north. Because as you recruit troops, you it's gonna take a while to get those troops to you. So forty two days is a long time in the grand scheme of things. So that will be it for this military tutorial portion. Uh, 50 minutes to go through all the stuff in the military. There's a lot of military stuff to go through. Uh, the next episode, I'm going to go attack the third core here. Speed it up. The next episode, we'll go into the tactical map. Kind of show you how this all works. Purposely, one of these armies will get in contact sooner rather than later so we'll kind of see who gets there first and we'll see our first uh, battle on this map and we'll go through the tactical options so thank y'all for joining me guys i will label all these videos in chapters so you can easily access what is where i will see you guys next time later